to mark their calendar for November 1st. After church, we're going to have a 50th anniversary for two parties, the Rices and the Gals, and we put it right smack in the middle of their anniversaries. So we'll do a potluck, and we'll just kind of talk with me, and we'll figure out who's bringing what, and we'll have a good little party. Awesome. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, this time we'll do offering. <laughs> Praise God. On this song, let's go ahead and stand because the days of Elijah, they praised God and they have voiced the love of God upon them. And so should we, because the day is coming when we're going to rejoice. Behold, he will come. Declaring the word of the Lord. 
peace for the days of your servant Moses, righteousness be in restored. Fill these for the days of great trial, of famine and darkness and sorrow. Still we are the voice in the desert crying, preparing. Children's church can go to the back. <laughs> Good night. Praise the Lord, it is good to be here today. How many are glad that you're alive? Ah, praise the Lord. We've looked at Romans chapter 8, and we talked about hope rising. It's amazing when I started this, I did not know that they're going to put a disease in America and different things like that, and most of those were preached during that time. Then we looked at Habakkuk about living the faith. And uh, we just finished it last week. Now I want us to look at the disciples' prayers. This is the prayer, the vantage point. A vantage point. I got a vantage over something. And what is that? It's in prayer. We can overcome anything that comes against us if we take and spend time in prayer. 
And I want to look at the first one here of seeing God's presence in desperate times. And each and every one of us are coming to these points in our lives where they come. In retrospect, we have finished the book of Habakkuk, which opened with a beleaguered Hebrews who was praying some long, very intense prayers. But Habakkuk, in chapter 2, he stops everything. And he says that he climbed into a tower to wait and to see what the Lord will say to me and how will you answer my complaint. Now, the question that I wanted to present to you today is does God want us to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders, especially in desperate times like these? Many philosophers of our times are saying that these times that we're living in today will not only go down in history, but they will be studied and analyzed for many years, at least a millennium that's coming up. These times have already been called the tough times, and it's down economical time, and it isn't finished yet. Many fear that the worst might be around the next corner. This comment is coming from people who supposed to be in the know and that they are the ones that are trying to navigate us in order to get us out of this predicament and to keep us from repeating this again and again and again. But the trouble is, is that nobody has a clear idea where we are. It's really making us nervous when nobody knows when it's going to come to an end. But the thing that are all agreement to most of us is that it's when it does end, we are never going to go back to doing life ever again the same. And that is the precisely why we need to have a new perspective. A perspective that we need to pray down from heaven and how he answers all my complaints. You got any complaints? My wife thinks I do. And uh, she always wants a little bit more to be added to the, the our budget and things like that. And that is what I want you to look at. There's something in our lives that we're wanting more. We're trying to stop certain things. And we come to that point in the Lord's Prayer that we need to have this perspective where we learn to see that God has for us a vantage point. And our goal is to grasp from this prayer to see things from a new perspective as well as to gain a new confidence Can we be like Habakkuk? Can we climb up the tower and get up there to see where God is at, what God is doing? No matter, even if there's a whole bunch of armies out there, I'm going to look for God. I want God. I want him to do things. And it's during these tough times, might not end any time soon, and we get a greater confidence in God, a new understanding that he is definitely in control. Philip Yancey's wrote a lot of books in my library. This particular one, prayer, does it make any differences? Prayer and only prayer restores our visions to the one that more resembles God's vision. We know that he's there. And prayer restores my vision, and I begin to see God. I begin to vision him. I begin to see what he's doing. It is this prayer that helps us to have a proper focus and to be able to see those things from God's perspective of who God is and who I am not. Have you stopped looking at your knots in your life? Have you focused in on it? When I'm talking to God, I'm able to embrace my smallness and I can learn from his bigness, and all that he can do. And prayer is the only thing that helps me to see things from God's vantage point and that I can understand 
that his ways are higher, his thoughts are bigger, and his wisdom is broader than mine. His love is so much deeper than mine. And all these things challenge us. So back in Habakkuk, pre-Babylonian captivity, there were prophets who lived in that desperate time. There was three of them, Jeremiah, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah. These are people who had lost their homes and they had lost their occupation. They had lost their homeland. And the greater yet, they even lost their hope. They were totally ready to throw up and get up everything. But we see that God was talking to them, saying that he not only sees where they are, but that God has the power to change the circumstances that we have right now. And I don't care what governor or anything that's in this world, we can trust God, that God is taking care of his people. And what God says to them in these desperate times in Jeremiah, he was in another part of town inside of Jerusalem. He wrote and said these words, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. What a powerful words these are. For I know the plans that I have set for you. I tell you what, and that's what is happening. He goes on to say, They are plans for God, good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope, in those days when you pray, I will listen. If you will look for me, how? Wholeheartedly, not just part, wholeheartedly. If you look, you will find me. Amen. But God is able to do all those things in our lives. And in this prayer, we'll find that the key of confidence and the key that he has in hope for you, and that we then know that God's going to seek and focus and do all the things that God wants to do for me, for you, for all of us. And you'll need to circle those words in your notes that in those days when you pray, that's when you need to pray. Tell me you don't need to pray when you're looking at everything that's happening right now. Tell me if it's not a need to pray, if there's all the things that are happening all around us. We can sit there and go like this all we want. I remember when I was a kid, I went and I did that, and I twisted this one here, and I put this one here, and then I went like this, and I had all these crossing my legs, tried doing my toes, couldn't do it, cross my eyes. I mean, that, it, that's not the way to get things done. It comes to a point in your life that you need, when you pray, in those days, listen, look for me wholeheartedly. You will find me. Now, I want you to go with me to a few hundred years into Jeremiah's future and see the time when, even times when Jesus walked on this earth. Jesus was a man that was devoted to prayer. In fact, if you read the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, in fact, if you're ever going out on a date and you've never been on a date with somebody, this is your first date. This is my demands to Desiree. When you go out and get in a car, get the biggest family Bible that you got. Have them pack it out to the car, sit down in their spot, then set it down between you and he and say to him, I dare you to ju jump over Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. You know, just get control and different things like that. So we come to that point that we come, we say, God, I want you. So I looked at Jesus. He's a man of prayer. It said that he went to prayer. He stayed all night to pray. He got into a boat to go to the other side so he could pray. Jesus went before the Father to pray. Jesus, a man of intercessor prayer for his people in Revelation and their tears that were attracted heaven. And his followers saw a direct correlation between his teaching, his miracles, and his wisdom that all came from what is called a prayer life. Jesus prayed. Do you think Jesus had to pray? He could say anything, anything would happen. He could say that the waters would roll back. He could do anything, all those things. But Jesus showed them and they saw them that he was praying. And sometimes we don't, as men, we don't come to that point that we don't 
come to Jesus and as the one dis unknown disciple or a follower turned around, said, Rabbi, teacher, Jesus, teach us to pray. Imagine that you're a person who uh, loved golf and the greatest golfer in the world moved next door to you. I'm not talking about Tiger Woods either. I'm talking to you about maybe Arnold Palmer is there. He is not only a good person, he knows how to make golf course. My God knows how to make the golf course around me. So I can see that I can do that. Now, if you had Arnold Palmer living next to you, he had landscaped his property like you wouldn't believe. Beautiful, beautiful yacht guard there. And one day you were having some small talk between you and your little buddy next door, Arnold. And, and he says, if I can help you with anything, would you ask him the ideas uh, on landscaping or would you ask him how to golf? I'd want to know how to fix my yard to get it to look good. And that's what happened between Jesus' disciples. Over in Luke chapter 11, verse 1, John, once Jesus was in a certain place praying, as he finished, one of his disciples came to him and said, Lord, teach us to pray. Jesus said, this is how you should pray. Amen. And he gets them all focused in on it. And here's what happened on that day. There's an unknown disciple who said, I don't know how to create universes. I just want to learn Jesus. Teach me how to pray. I don't want to know how these things go on. Maybe nine or ten people say they pray regularly. They say seven out of ten say they pray every day. I don't know if we really do. We probably don't even get close to it. And so we look at this survey of churches that a majority of church people, followers of Jesus Christ, said that the same thing as the followers of Jesus Christ asked, Lord, help us to pray more effectively. How many of you feel guilty about your prayer life or wish your prayers were effectively to where you can raise up your hands and say, God, I surrender to you? You're not looking to show anybody. Chances are you might be behind a wall. You might be in a lonely place. And all these struggles with prayers in our lives, and we ask ourselves, how can I be a representative to this church to where I can go out and say, God, Jesus, I want you to teach me how to pray. And somehow or another, Jesus wants to teach us how to. And he belts it out. I'm waiting for this words to come out from him. He's going to say the very first words. He said, this is how you pray. Our Father. Wow. The person next to you. Our Father. In the nation of religious people, still there's some. There's in that point that they realize that we can say our Father. And there's a, a point that comes in our lives that we realize that God's presence is there. And Jesus taught them how to come to the point of pray. Now, I want to tell you some things about prayer that is not. Prayer is not a performance. You're not doing it say, look at me, I'm so good. Yeah, and everybody wants to pray, let me do it. And they talk these beautiful words and everything like that. And then they rob God. They do this, do that things like that, we got to come to that point. Who of us to the point that we pray in love with God? In the Beatitudes, in Matthew 6 and 5, that he turned around 6 and 7, but he comes into that 6 part when he says, when you pray, verse 5, don't be like the hypocrites who love to pray publicly on street corners and in the synagogues where everyone can see them. I tell you the truth. That is all the reward they will ever get. These people would look at their time pieces, two minutes before nine, before 12, between th the third hour, the sixth, and the hours they would go around at this as they stood there. And all of a sudden, they run out there and say, look at me, I'm going to pray on the corner. I'm gonna... Oh, doesn't that look silly? You know, 
it, but at the same token, I don't know the words sometimes. I don't know how to say it. But somehow or another, God gives us the words where we can go to the point. Now, I remember a mother heard her daughter praying, now I lay myself to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul will keep. Then they said these words, eeny, meeny, mighty, mo." Oh, that's not it, is it? And let it go. We come and say, God, help me. And here's what Jesus says about prayer. He said then, when you pray, don't babble on and on as people of other religions do. They think their prayers are answered merely by repeating their words again and again. Don't be like them. For our Father knows exactly what you need. Even before you ask him, pray like this, Our Father. I'm here with you to pray. You are here for us to pray. When somebody is in need, we all join together. We pass out the phones. We get on the, the list and telling others about somebody that's in need of prayer. And these are times that come into our life. But prayer is all about a relationship, a prayer about relationship with God and coming to that point that an example is being David showing and sharing these things, his, his life with God. And in the big one, he said, the, uh, we know what it's to pray the 23rd Psalm. We know that he's given us guidance. But over in chapter 42, it, in verse 8, he said, Each day the Lord pours his unfailing love upon me. And through each night I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. It's getting excited about what God's doing. And you don't have to have your neighbors see it. You don't have to have anybody know about it. It's you and God coming before God. And God begins to pour these out upon you. Even if you're in a time of bondage and lamentation. Jeremiah wrote that. He declared that the Lord is good to those who depend on him. And uh, to those, you need to circle that word. The Lord is good to those who depend on him, to those who search for him. So it's good to wait quietly for salvation from the Lord. And that's only when you can wait on the Lord and understand that you have a relationship with God and only God can give it to you. And if you don't have a relationship, you're going to have to have prayers like this. I want this. I want it now. And all these different things. It's empty. It's empty. But we come to the point that we know that we can gain perspective through the prayer that we touch the hem of the garment. And we struggled till we got there. Now, it begins when I see God as a personal person. Jesus begins teaching them with these words. In chapter 6, verse 9, Jesus said, Pray like this, Our Father. When Jesus taught us this prayer, the first thing he wanted them to understand is that God wanted us to have a personal relationship with him, and we joined together with our family and our friends and our loved ones. In the days of Jesus, the people didn't view God as our Father. They viewed God as you couldn't say his word. You dropped out all the vowels out and left all the consonants in there and his name became a four-letter word and different things like that but you know god wanted us to come to the point he said i want you to be very clear with people i want you to pray our father stop everything else and stop saying me 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 say our father in other words my brothers my sisters my all that are surrounding me that God wants us to come to the point that we have a, a father that's there, a relationship with him, a point to where that God is with us. And we understand that God is able to do all those things in our lives if we'll turn it over to him. Paul said in Romans 8, 15, when we were talking about hope rising, he said, you have not received a spirit that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you receive God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children, now we call him Abba, Father. That literally means Father, Father is what it's about. But that's the way he is in our life because it's not just him. I've got you and I need you. 
I need you to pray. I need you to pray for the services. I know that you need to pray that God will touch those that are not here in church, that are falling out of churches all around us and different things around us. But I want us to understand that when we pray to the Father, we can come to a point of intimacy, personalism, and transparent, vulnerable. We understand that God wants to do all those things in our lives if we will just surrender them to him. And it only can come way, and that's by prayer, his goodness, his love, his power. All these things open unto us because God is a personal God. But he's also something else. It happens that I gain the understanding that God is not only personal, he's present. He is omnipresent. I can't do that. You can't do that. Our spouses can't do it. But I want to tell you, he can be with you all around you at all times. He has all this power. And he's omnipotent in that moment because he's all powerful. He's able to do all these things in our lives. So we come to that and say, God, I want his presence in my life. And it's not just in heaven. He's here with me. He does watch over me and different things. Sometimes I feel him laughing, and it's just because he's happy with us. And sometimes he just sees and the tears fall from his eyes as he's praying for us and and guiding him in all of our lives. That Our Father, which is in heaven, which is the next thing we'll talk about, is that point in his life. And around the earth, the stars and all the air that we breathe, that the heaven is there, our Father is there, the heaven's there, all these things. Now, what are we going to do, God, when we turn it all to you and we just turn it over to you, to the circumstances of my life? Something happened to me when I turned 50 years old. I found AFib. I didn't look for it, but I found it. There were things that came into my life that I had physical things that weren't all that good. But I want to tell you, it's in those dark hours that God was always there. He never left me. He never turned on me. He was there all the time. He's available, and he comes in that point, that presence in our life, and that he can speak to me, and I feel him talk to me many different times. And we understand that God's in control, and I can have control of my life. I heard a story about a woman that was on a plane, and she was terrified in the flying of that plane. A minister encouraged her that Jesus said that when he ascended up into heaven, he said, I am with you always. As she was praying there day that day, and he says, oh, lo, I'm with you always. She said, no, lo, I am. <laughs> it, we put a W in there. And that's what she prayed that day. And that's what we need to do. Psalm 16, 8 says, I know the Lord is always with me. I will not be shaken, for he is right beside me. <laughs> Look at your person next to you, your spouse, your friend, the people that you care about, and tell them, say, He's right beside me. Amen. He is there. Amen. How many believes it? I do. Praise God. God is always where you are. The third thing is, is God gave us perspective in prayer, and that he's personal, present, and he's perfect. I want to tell you, my God is a great God. Awesome God. Earthly fathers have gotten a lot of bad raps, They came to the point that they did this and they did that. And one man was praying over one of our fine preachers in the church of God. He was out there as an overseer, and he came in late that night in Eugene, Oregon. And he was turning around, and his wife had left a a note talking about their little son, Raymond. And something that had happened. He turned around, he found a place to pray the rest of the night. He could not stand it. He said, God, if I can win everybody into the churches in Oregon to God, and I lost my own son, what have I gained? And he turned around and got close to his son and turned his prayers to God. And he turned around to become one of the greatest preachers in our denomination. He tells the story. And that's what a great big God that we have. He wants you to know that he's there and that he's going to take care of all these things in our lives. And our Father who is in heaven, that your name uh, be kept holy. 
hallowed thy name it is. Name is kept before him. And then in Proverbs 9, 10, it tells us, fear the Lord is the foundational wisdom. Means I sunder it to him. Knowledge of the Holy One results in good judgment. Look at Psalms 19, 4. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you. O Lord, my rock, my redeemer. And then in 1 John 3, 1, it said, how great is the love the Father has lavished on us that he should be called children of God. I am a child of God. Do, do you say I make you never make mistakes? I didn't say that. I am still a child of God. Sometimes my children have not always pleased me. More often than not, they have. But those are the times that you have to love them both ways. And you understand that God's in control of it. We come to the point that we realize I'm by a created God, loved by God, and a God that has a plan for me. I know he's in all things. John 1, 12 says, But to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. I'm a child of God. Amen. Go ahead and criticize me if you want to. Somebody's criticizing on you. You might as well, you know, if you feel safe about doing it, go for it. But no, my God's a mighty God, an awesome God. I was pastoring in Roseburg, Oregon. I got to get in the position. There was a preacher that was speaking at the camp meeting. And I was at camp meeting at this time because I was on youth day and I was on the birth on the youth board. And I remembered B.L. Kelly. He had his father-in-law there, T.L. Forrester. You remember him, T.L. Forrester? Do you remember him, Jim? Uh, oh, my goodness. He was a missionary that was unbelievable. And um, his daughter could sing like you couldn't believe. But he got up there, and he was going to, at the end of his career, preaching. I was still sitting up there because that's where I was pulled, told to sit. And I watched him. All of a sudden, he'd grab his like this. But I saw him step up on his toes. And then I heard him slowly say, Our Father. What an awesome God that we can understand he is my father. I am his child. I'm to the point that I, and I watched him stand up on those toes and pray those words, our father again. And then he cried it out the third and the fourth time. And suddenly I never understood those first two words until this man stood up and he prayed out, Our Father. And I want to tell you, my friends, that's the kind of God that we come to, that we can say, Our Father. And he began to pray for the church and for the missionaries. and for He just continued on. Because if you hang around Our Father, you're going to copy him. You're going to lift it up because that's the kind of God that we serve. Amen. Praise God. Father, we surrender ourselves to you. We know, Lord, that when we go into the next one, we're going to talk about confusing times. But, Father, I know you are the one that gives us the ability, the vantage point. And, Father, before I ever want to ever to start a prayer, may I honor you with my position, our Father. Father, Father, we love you.